Hey everyone, Chat Cemetery is back. I am your host, Deanna Chapman, and today I am joined by Drew Deach. We are talking all about the 1997 movie, The Night Flyer. It is based off of one of Stephen King's short stories that appeared in his collection, Nightmares and Dreamscapes. Drew, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. I'm, I'm excited to talk about this one. I know we <laughs> the last couple episodes I've been on, you know, we've had some some kookier movies, yes. some not 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 the greatest in the entire Stephen King filmed canon. And I picked out the Night Flyer because this was a, a video store staple growing up as far as like I remember seeing the cover everywhere in every video store I went to. Uh, I remember you know, I rented it and I remembered having a pretty good time with it. And I don't think I had revisited it since then, so it's been probably close to 20 years or so since I saw this. Okay. And and revisiting it, I I didn't know or wasn't aware of certain things when I first watched it, mainly that this is from producer Richard P. Rubenstein, who has a long and storied history of Stephen King adaptations, um, among them Creepshow, uh, thinner, a, a whole bunch. Like he worked with George Romero a lot and he worked on quite a few Stephen King adaptations and seeing his name pop up. I was like, Oh, okay, cool. Like that. This is usually, if not a good sign, uh, at least the sign that, Oh, okay. Then this is probably going to be a fairly decent adaptation of, of the source material. Yeah. And like you said, the, the night flyer, this is based off a short story. And it's interesting because I, I think, the crux of the story being that there is this ghostly person that's flying into kind of rural airstrips and killing people who we then learn is, is a vampire. And the story is going to follow a kind of tabloid reporter trying to get the scoop on this story. I'm like, this, this seems like a good episode of something like Tales from the Crypt. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought up the producer portion of this, because like you said, you have Rubenstein and you have Mitchell Gallen or Galen, whichever way it is pronounced, who both worked on multiple things together too. So you have this sort of producer team that has been doing King adaptations. You know, they did Thinner together as well, I think, and at least The Stand and The Langoliers. So you have this overlap with you know, these people who keep returning to King properties. And I think it's interesting which ones people choose to do because you have someone like Mick Garris too, who has done numerous King properties and some more of his stuff is going to be coming up shortly with the Shining TV miniseries. And Mm -hmm. it's just so fun to see when people are excited about Stephen King stuff, mostly because I know I'm not alone, (laughs) you know, (laughs) thanks to people like you and some of the other guests I've had. I'm like, okay, you know, clearly Stephen King has enough stuff to interest a lot of different people. And, you know, maybe some people just like the fantasy stuff or some people really love the gritty horror stuff that he does. There is some variety there. And then you have all of the Richard Bachman stuff that is even more different than some of the other stuff. And, you know, this cast, too, isn't really a ton of big names. When I was looking, it's like you have Miguel Ferrar, and then you have a ton of people who have been in anywhere from like two to 10 movies, and that's it. Yeah, it's it's interesting because um, Miguel Ferrer, who who I know is in the, the Stand adaptation as well, Yeah, uh, he, he was a notorious dork as a person. He was a big comic book fan, uh, of just a big pop culture fan, and clearly is a Stephen King fan. And yes. for for a project like this, and and the kind of character that he's playing, Richard Dees, this really scumbag, jaded, kind of weekly world news type reporter, you need somebody who's going to anchor this movie, because it's pretty much all going to be from this character's perspective. And it's a character that is pretty much patently unlikable that's Uh how he's supposed to be you have to get somebody like miguel fair to do it and he just he carries the movie on his shoulders because no matter how scummy or confused he is during the course of this he's always super entertaining yeah and he has some moments with his boss where you can tell they're 
both jerks. So it's one of those things where there isn't really anyone who is likable in this movie. I mean, you have Catherine, whose nickname is Jimmy, and it's sort of this play on Jimmy Olsen, from what I can tell, because I would venture to say that most people do not nickname women men's names, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so no. I was just kind of like, okay, her nickname's Jimmy. That's a little weird. They do make the Jimmy Olsen joke, and you kind of get that she's the sidekick in this, but she's actually good at her job, and she doesn't have to be a jerk about it to everyone in order to get her job done. Yeah, I, I like uh, the actress Julie Entwistle, who plays Catherine. She's playing the, the cub reporter. She's new on the job. She wants the scoop. She's hardworking. She's dedicated. She wants to be the next big star reporter like Richard Dees is at this <laughs> really crummy rag called Inside View. But she's determined. She's doing the work. And she ends up being something of a partner, but also a foil to Dee's. I I kind of wish there was a little bit more of her in the movie, because my assumption is that her character is not present in the short story. That that she feels like a character that was invented to give another element of conflict to the story than it just being Dee's tracking down uh, this vampire Dwight Renfield. So I I like her addition. I wish I actually would like I say wish there was a little bit more of her in the movie. Yeah. Because while while I enjoyed my rewatch of this quite a bit, I do think that the story structure is not the most favor- favorable towards being made into feature length because the whole story is Richard D's just flying around to these different places after these attacks have occurred and trying to find out what he can. And there's certainly some great sequences that come out of that, but it really doesn't keep the conflict ramped up because it it's mm-hmm. basically... A, this was made and, and released as an HBO movie and then afterwards had a very short, limited theatrical run. Okay. And, and it feels like a TV movie because it feels like, okay, you kind of have the same three things that happen. Dee's goes to a place, finds out about the the kill that happened there, is warned in some ghostly way by Dwight Renfield to stay away from him. He escapes, repeat two more times until the, the final act. So it almost feels like there could be built-in commercial breaks. Uh-huh. But again, because you have it being Miguel Fair, who you're following around the whole time, it's it's never not enjoyable and and i think he makes up for some of the repetitive pacing of the movie but otherwise i i think this is actually a a pretty good example of how to adapt stephen king as far as tone Uh because out of a lot of the 90s adaptations even though there are some that i that i like i think a lot of them have an issue with tone yeah and The Night Flyer is the one exception where I'm like, this actually succeeds at being genuinely creepy at times. (laughs) It really does. And I'm also glad that this wasn't one where they were like, oh, let's make sequels out of it. Like they did with Sometimes They Come Back and The Mangler, Mm -hmm. because I think that's when you really get into this territory of clearly you just wanted to make something that was low budget and you'd probably make some money on and it has no real impact on the source material or anything. And speaking of the source material, I read this about six or seven books ago when I was reading Nightmares and Dreamscapes and it was one that I think stood out to me because of the tone of it. And you have this serial killer mystery going around and then king does his sort of classic supernatural twists and it turns out the killer's a vampire so it has this element to it that you don't necessarily expect because just a serial killer story by itself is grim enough and king can definitely work some magic with that but then he puts on this twist that it's this vampire and you get this visual aspect out of that story in this movie where you have so many great gore effects too. And you're just like, okay, this is sort of the Stephen King adaptation that we live for, even though we know it's not going to be super high quality, like some of the more 
recent stuff or even things like, you know, the Green Mile adaptation that comes a little later. Yeah, I mean, when you talk about the effects and quality of the movie, I think a big bonus that this movie has going for it is that the effects are done by K and B, um, which are they're pretty much like the god tier monster effects. That's uh, okay. Kurtzman, Nicotero, and and Berman, and, and most people know know Greg Nicotero is from The Walking Dead and has worked on tons of. Uh, Stephen King adaptations as far as from an effects person and then eventually uh, I think even writing and directing like he's kind of been one of the shepherds of the new Shutter creep show series so he he definitely and, and along him and the entire KNB effects team they they put some real money on screen as far as the gore effects that we see and uh-huh. the eventual creature effects that we get that I think for for this for this budget range and this level of a production are, are pretty impressive. Yeah, I would certainly agree with that too, because you have that final act where you see Richard just kind of losing his mind because he has come to interact with the serial killer and realizes he's a vampire. And when you get that reveal too, I think they made it look just gross enough to where you were kind of put off by it. And then you're like, okay, you get used to it after a few moments and you can take a breath. But then he goes inside and it's like everyone is suddenly undead and he's hacking away at them with an axe. At least he thinks they're undead. And then the cops come in and you find out he's just literally destroying people with an axe. (laughs) (laughs) Well, uh, something that I love about Stephen King when it comes to vampires is that he's he's very hard line about his feelings when it comes to vampires. He doesn't really buy into the romanticism of them. He he really likes vampires as monsters. And that's true going all the way back to Salem's Lot. Yeah. He really digs them as these undead creatures. And we see so much of that in the Night Flyer where even though there are moments where Oh, Dwight Renfield kind of casts a spell on people and hypnotizes them to be under his will. It, it it's never from a point of like romanticism or allure or anything. They are just under his spell because he's keeping his food nice and tame. And even the eventual design that we see where he has very kind of bat-like features like that kind of squashed in nose and then I I love the effect that we see when he opens his jaws and he just has one singular huge fang on yeah. the, on you know the top and bottom of his jaw it's such a creepy look that it's always stuck with me and something i really like about dwight renfield is we don't really know anything about him right. as a person they do a very nice job of keeping that character shrouded in all of this mystery and Even the fact that his plane is black with red piping and you can tell that those kind of planes, it seems like you can tell that those kind of planes don't seem to be that color scheme Mm -hmm. because you have Richard who owns his own plane. Clearly, he knows a little bit about them and he's calling around and being like, have you seen, you know, this Cessna or whatever it was? And they're like, oh, we get a lot of those. He's like, yeah, but this one's black. (laughs) And so you just sort of get a sense that there's something completely different about this guy. And you have Richard going around, like you said, to all these towns and kind of repeating the same story over a few times before we get to that big final moment. And I feel like this is something that you could have definitely shortened and made, you know, like a sequence in Creepshow 3, maybe, which I know Mm -hmm. is something that I had said I wasn't going to cover because it really isn't quite as prominent as the first two as far as discussing it in relation to Stephen King. Yeah, you you can completely avoid Creepshow 3 because it was basically a uh, in-name only kind of project. Yeah, so I don't plan on covering that. But if they had put something like this in it, obviously, I would have been more inclined to do so. But I think it would have fit that format Mm. a little more. I think you could have gone and done a Creepshow that was a lot darker in nature because some of them... Especially with the first two, you kind of have these stories that aren't really as 
grim and dark as this one is, because even when you're watching this, if you take a look at the lighting, nothing's really all that bright. Even when they're in the office for the paper, it's like you can tell this is a smaller operation. They don't have this big budget. There aren't these bright fluorescent lights all over the office like you would expect in an office building. Yeah, I, I can't speak to the original short story novella, but as far as the movie's concerned, this has that meaner tone of some of King's stories. Uh -huh. There's there's times when he gets mean and this is a nasty uh kind of a nasty little yarn. Like our our protagonist is unlikable and scummy and works for a scumbag paper. He does awful things you know when when we're introduced to him he's arguing with his editor about cutting a photo of a dead baby yeah which, which is like whoa <laughs> this is the kind of guy we're gonna follow around it's like okay interesting and then as we learn more about kind of his jaded persona and he has his motto you know, never believe what you publish and never publish what you believe. We get to see that, that he talks more and more about this job, doing this. You know, people might think of it as some supermarket rag that has sensationalist headlines, but I've had to look into the darkest, craziest parts of humanity. And that's what stuck with me. And, and then he tells the story about the former reporter that was working there who maybe committed suicide like that's what it seems like and yeah. he was he was there to photograph her her body which was you know in the tub with a plastic bag around the head it's it's twisted dark stuff and i i like that the night flyer never really devolves into kind of kookiness it really commits to that darker tone which is commendable something else and i'm just looking at my notes here that i that I think, I don't know if this is a conscious thing or an unconscious thing, but I drew some parallels between this story and the basic framework of Joe Hill's Nosferatu. Okay. Where it's like, okay, you have this vampiric serial killer in a black vehicle who's going around the country. That's how he gets around to his victims and stuff. I was like, that's an interesting connection, yeah. considering King and Hill. I don't know if that was, again, pulled consciously, but there's never a direct, as, as far in, in the movie, assertion that the plane itself is somehow spiritually possessed or something. The, the opening of the movie has a character looking into the plane and then the door smacking him on the head. And we uh -huh. don't see if, you know, Dwight is the one doing that or if it's the plane itself but i mean when when richard finally finds the plane is able to step inside and just all the instruments are covered in blood and there's you know giant piles of dirt with worms in it which is very old school vampire myth that they have to take you know the grave dirt that they were buried in with them that's what they have to sleep in again that's not that's never stated i like these right. little things just being color for this character same same with in the opening when they say uh, the, the editor says you know his name is dwight renfield well that's most likely not his real name yeah. because it's based on dwight fry who played renfield in dracula we never learn who is what his real name is the the most information we get about him is a photograph album that dees finds in the cessna mm -hmm. and it's just a couple photos of like yeah it looks like he was from an unknown time period and he was uh, some kind of aviator and it looks like he might have been married that's it other than that we know nothing about him and we do get a glimpse of his true face mm -hmm. it kind of goes between his human face and vampire face at the end there in the lightning you kind of see it change in the shadows which i thought was a cool effect too because obviously you kind of have two people standing in with the different faces and that's how they kind of cut that together but using the shadows in that way worked really well and there are some comparisons to be made between Dwight and Richard as well because they're both very manipulative in different ways but it still kind of gives you this sense that oh we're not going to like any of these people you know Dwight seems <laughs> to manipulate that older woman who goes into the hair salon and wants to look different a day after she was in there getting her hair done already. And you have 
Richard who lies to Catherine about sharing a byline and then shoves her in the wardrobe in the hotel room and just locks her in there so she can't help him out after he's already used her help the entire night before to get a step ahead of her. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, the it's, it's a very kind of in-your-face read, but it's there. It's like, yeah, they are both types of vampires. One is a literal vampire, and yeah. the other one is somebody who is, you know, preying on, you know, who still needs to feast on blood in the sense of that's what, you know, classically, if it bleeds, it leads uh, as, as a journalist. And th- this is all stated outright by Dwight when he and Richard finally confront each other. Uh-huh. And what is kind of, I mean, this is the one kooky moment of, <laughs> of the thing where uh, Richard is in a public bathroom and he looks in the mirror and he can just see in the urinal blood coming out of thin air. And it's like, oh, okay, you can't see him because vampires you know, can't see the reflection. And so there's like blood pee in this movie, which is like the one goofball concept which it's like okay that's oh all right but then my favorite thing is that throughout all of these investigations that richard has been doing whenever he gets to the place of the victims all the mirrors are broken and it's like oh, okay vampire thing you can't can't see the reflection hates mirrors but then in this bathroom scene we cut between richard looking in the mirror where he doesn't see anything to Dwight actually there and as Dwight walks up behind Richard and passes the bathroom mirrors they bend and smash it's so cool it's a yeah. really kind of low tech effect but it it's so effective in making the presence of this villain feel really menacing it adds that extra element to the story that you wouldn't get without a lot of the visual effects that they do in this movie, which, you know, I know in the past we've talked about some of the more obscure adaptations, too, and we've been somewhat close on most of them. You've enjoyed some more than I have, but I think we're on the same page for this one, where even though you haven't read the story just as a horror movie in you know, the late 90s, it's one of those things where you're like, okay, you take the time period into consideration. You had obviously seen this way before I had, you know, this watch through was the first time I had watched it. But I always go into it with that mindset. Okay, I know what the story is going to be. I know it's about this serial killer who flies around and murders people at each stop and ends up being a vampire. I think when I originally read the story. I thought it was a little weird at times, but overall, it was still one of the highlights of the Nightmares and Dreamscapes collection. And to actually sit down and enjoy this movie and not have it turn out like something visually like the Langoliers, oh, it, yeah. it was just so nice to be able to only recognize really one person out of the whole thing and still find something good that came out of it. And overall, this one was a pretty solid adaptation. And even though the story might drag on a little too long, and, you know, this movie's only about an hour and a half, so it's not like you waste a ton of time on it. No, I, I, I don't think it overstays its welcome at all. Yeah. And, and I think I think the pacing is good. It's just the repetitive structure. Yeah. It's like, okay, this we've had this kind of same scenario already play out two times before. Um, thankfully, I think the final act more than, you know, brings it all home in a really fun, effective, creepy way. I love the change from color to black and white. Yeah. To signify Richard's, you know, after he's made to drink Dwight's blood and kind of get a vision of this hellscape sort of thing. I mean, it's all very low budget. It's just like fog machines and extras and stuff, but I think it's pretty effective. I I feel comfortable calling the Night Flyer like a minor gem as far as Stephen King adaptations are concerned. I, I think people who really like Stephen King, if they've never seen the if they've never seen this movie it's definitely one to check out i think it's a lot better than a lot of the direct to video or direct to tv stuff uh-huh. that was made and and to be fair you know this comes out in 97 this is around the era when i think peak stephen king 
as far as like everything getting adapted is about to happen. Yeah. Where it's just like, oh my gosh, anything. Like he he wrote a book and then like a day later they made a TV movie out of it. This is around that time. This is just on the cusp of it being, I think, cultural saturation to a point. And it's one of the it's one of the better examples. I think it works as kind of a a smaller production, a smaller story. And especially considering a lot of Stephen King stuff from this era, one that actually ends up being kind of scary. Yeah, absolutely. And you're definitely right about the number of adaptations sort of increasing right around this time. Before this, we have Thinner, and after it, you have the Shining TV series, you have the TV movies for Quicksilver Highway and Trucks, which probably aren't going to be super fantastic because, you know, you've had things like Maximum Overdrive before and you've seen how that goes. So, mm. you know, <laughs> we'll, we'll see how those go. But even today, we're kind of hitting that same period again because the Institute, one of his latest books was optioned for a film or TV show or something before the book even came out. Yeah, I I, I definitely think that the, the Stephen King adaptation thing, because he's so prolific, it comes in cycles. Yeah. The the same thing happened in, in the early 80s. You know, a, after Carrie and The Shining happened, it's like, oh, yeah, there's tons of Stephen King stuff that got made that nobody other than your show wants to talk about. <laughs> and then it kind of dipped off in, into the late 80s it, there weren't as many things and then the 90s came around and king himself was a little bit more enamored with tv miniseries and tv stuff because he felt that there was a lot more creative freedom actually going on there instead of having to work with big studios so and he just found you know there's producers like rubenstein uh who clearly king was favorable towards adapting his work and and I, I think the Night Flyer is is something that it's like, you know, if it ever got another version or another take on it, I, I think it would be a, a great contender for something like the new Shutter Creep Show series. Yeah. Like, I think it's a, a story that might work a lot better in a shorter format, but as a feature length movie, it's got a really solid but small cast and, and especially a great leading man. Uh, the effects are really good mm -hmm. and very bloody, if that's something that people like to take note of, is that the effect, there is a lot of blood in this movie. I think it actually has moments of genuine atmosphere and creepiness, and I think it wraps itself up really nicely in a twisted, dark way. Uh, again, I'll reiterate, this is one of the darker Stephen King kind of stories, but if if you have the stomach for that, and that's something that entices you i highly recommend the night flyer yeah it was certainly a fun one to watch and i guess we can go ahead and get into some ratings and some final final thoughts here but i ended up giving this a three out of five which i felt was pretty on the money given you know the budget and just the time it was made and the fact that you're taking a shorter king story and making it into a feature length film and like we've said you could certainly parse that down for something like creep show and it would still work you could even do something like just have a murder board and have all the different cities listed and you'll get the gist that hey this guy has been doing this for a little while now i also gave it a three out of five if i did half stars i'd probably give throw it another half star just because okay i think miguel Ferrer is so good he is right? because so much of the movie has to just be him talking into a tape recorder talking to himself he doesn't have a lot of people to bounce dialogue off of for the majority of the movie and he's still able to keep me engaged even though his character has pretty much zero redeeming qualities <laughs> yeah. um so that I think that goes to show how how much of a talented actor he was and that he he gave his all in this kind of a performance, you know, for a smaller, you know, direct to TV movie. Uh, I, I think that's very admirable. Yeah. And, and I think that the Night Flyers, a, a movie that because it didn't have a 
a significant theatrical release and it was kind of mostly known as a home video staple uh-huh. that it's mostly forgotten and i think that's a little unfair because as as far as these especially the direct to tv and direct to video stephen king adaptations go i think this is one that stands out from the bunch it makes me sad to know that this is one of those that is a little more forgotten. And then there's things like Children of the Corn that people can't s- seem to stop <laughs> adapting. <laughs> yeah, it's right. like, no, just just stop with that. We have plenty. We're good. And watch <laughs> things like The Night Flyer instead. Because I could see this one definitely having more of a cult following. But I think some of the problem is, too, is that it's not one of Stephen King's bigger stories. Obviously, right. Children of the Corn created a life of its own with mm. the number of theatrical releases it got. But even things like The Mangler, they went out and got Robert England, and then they did sequels after that. And while I'm glad this one doesn't have a sequel, I think it's one of those things where, yes, they only got one big name in it, but that was enough for it to make it good. Yeah, I, I do know that the uh, writer and director did have a a sequel at least in mind uh and of course it kind of went where you would expect it to go where it's like all right well now we're going to follow Catherine as the protagonist and she's going to find out more about who dwight renfield really is and i'm like nope i don't i don't want that like yeah that that's not what's interesting or what worked about the story for me this is a case where not knowing a whole lot about the villain is what made them so interesting the little few teases that we get about it was like that's just enough that's just enough to sate me and to still see him as this you know really terrifying persona and yeah i i would hope that you know if if one person listens to this and decides to check this movie out because of it i consider that a win you know one in the win column because i'm not i don't want to overhype it and say it's like it's really this underseen masterpiece that you all are missing out on it's like no it's just i think this is the definition of a hidden gem yeah that a lot of people may not have any inkling about and if any of this is is piqued your interest i would strongly recommend seeking out the night flyer i think it's i think it's definitely one that king fans will appreciate especially from this era of adaptations especially if you love interesting vampire stories too because Mm -hmm. i'm not a huge fan of vampire stories i you know watch salem's lot for this obviously i had been watching like the vampire diaries and then i was just like okay this is getting ridiculous so i had stopped watching it at some point way before it finished and they had like three spin-offs of the show or whatever it was so <laughs> vampire stories weren't necessarily like my bread and butter as far as horror stories go so the fact that king is sort of drawing me in a little more with the way he portrays vampires i think that's something that's very interesting interesting and i too recommend watching this even though we kind of spoiled everything for you but you know it's one of those things where it came out 20 plus years ago so (laughs) just watch it anyway (laughs) our our descriptions cannot spoil for you the engaging performance of miguel fair that's something you have to experience for yourself and seeing the effects play out i think is one of the best things about watching yeah. the movie. Like uh, if, if somebody had like a clip of every great effects moment, you know, if, if you could just had that as a compilation, it's like, look, there's, there's really good stuff in here, especially for a, a movie that went direct to HBO. Yeah. So I, yeah, I mean, I, I, I stand by what we're both saying is that like, yeah, if, if this isn't a movie, if you haven't seen this movie before, even though we, you know, pretty much told you what all goes down in it, Check it out. It really is worth your time. Yeah. One last thing before we go, though. If you like when you have these lower budget movies and you sort of notice these goofs in them, I will tell you there's a moment where a boom mic pops into frame. And Oh, really? Yeah. It was at it was towards the beginning when Richard is in the office with his boss and they send Jimmy out and she kind of comes back, says she forgot her purse or whatever and leaves again. And then the two of them are sitting down and a couple minutes after that or a minute after that or so the boom mic just kind of dips into the top of the screen and <laughs> goes oh, back that's, up that's so always adorable it's one of those things where you know even watching the stand which had 
quite a few big names in it at the time, they still had goofs like that, where sometimes a boom mic would drop in and it just wasn't worth it to go back and redo it, given the budget and the time, mm. probably. So that was something that actually my mom ended up catching. I was busy writing notes or something and I had to go back and I was like, oh, okay, yeah, that did happen. <laughs> oh, that's adorable. I love that. <laughs> Yeah, it's just one of those things where you're like, okay, you know, this wasn't the highest budget movie, but are we going to get that upset that a boom mic dropped in for a split second? No, but it is fun to note. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I wanted to end it on that fun little fact there. But Drew, thank you so much for coming on to talk about The Night Flyer. I know you and I have been having fun talking about some of these more obscure movies, and I'm very happy that at least you have watched all of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm always happy to, to come in and, and either go to bat for or, or take the bullet for some of these <laughs> Because this is definitely uh, prime Stephen King time in, in my kind of evolution and formation with King as as an author, as a storyteller. is like, that's when all these movies were coming out. So they're, they're very, very prominent in my mind. So I'll, always happy to come on and chat with you, Deanna. Awesome. Well, quickly, before we go, I want to let you know how you can support the podcast. We have a Patreon where you can get a thank you on the show for a dollar a month or $2 a month. We'll get you a Chat Cemetery sticker. You can rate and review us on iTunes, Google Podcasts, wherever you listen. And you can find us at Chat Cemetery on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. So follow us there if you want to keep up with when episodes are dropping, or I've started doing some new things on Instagram Thursday discussion posts. So check us out there. And as always, thank you for listening, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>